founding director of the Harvard School of Public Health China Initiative, a major <coughs> effort of the Harvard School of Public Health aimed at helping advance health and social development in China through a series of research studies. It's just an enormous pleasure to welcome you here and to learn from you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Judy, for that nice introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, my enormous uh, honor and pleasure to be part of this uh, grand public run. Uh, I'm basically prepared to do two things today. Uh, one is to provide an overview uh, of what's going on uh, across the Pacific in China's public health and the health system. And the secondly, I want to use this opportunity to introduce you to uh, PUMC and uh, the new School of Public Health, which now I'm heading and trying to discuss. is the rapid uh, economic uh, development, the growth. Uh, actually, the growth of the Chinese economy has become something like a world's envy. Uh, and uh, with the uh, rising of the standard of living and uh, over 400 million people being lifted out of poverty, of course, uh, uh, it would not be surprising for the people in this room to see uh, the improvement and continuous improvement of China's uh, uh, population health status. <coughs> the life expectancy uh, reached uh, uh, 74 for men and uh, uh, 78 for women in 2010. And uh, the life expectancy in Shanghai uh, exceeded uh, uh, 82 uh, on par, really, uh, with the more uh, developed countries. Infant mortality uh, came down, maternal mortality came down, and so on and so forth. So I'm not suggesting that all public health now in China is good. Uh, there are two major challenges I'd like to elaborate, uh, discuss a bit. One is uh, the fact that China is struggling with the double burden of infectious and non-communicable diseases at the same time. Second is uh, with the overall improvement of population health status and health care, there are also significant interregional and social economic inequalities and rising disparities among the uh, incomes when it comes to health status, access to health care, and so on and so forth. Now, yes, on one hand, the traditional uh, or conventional infectious diseases are abated both in terms of mortality rate as well as uh, morbidity rate. But several major infectious diseases still present a clear and present danger. China is the world's largest country when it comes to the largest number of MTR TB. Okay? And especially that's a problem with the uh, detainees, okay? the MDR TB cases mostly developed in China's uh, prison system. And uh, China is the world's largest country with a large number of people infected uh, with uh, hepatitis B, over uh, 200 million. And on top of it, in the past 10 years, uh, almost there is one to two emerging diseases <coughs> reported, newly diagnosed this, uh, for every two years. And SARS, you know, served as uh, both a wake-up call as well as the <coughs> tremendous interruption of the social activities and the economy when the academic turned uh, to uh, pandemic. And uh, the recent uh, fear of uh, H7N9 uh, served as another reminder, you know, the infectious diseases battle is a really unfinished agenda. 
Now, at the same time, uh, China is rapidly seeing its uh, 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 epidemiological transition. Uh, the NCDs have not only become the major causes of deaths, the incidence rate also increased, uh, contributing to the increasing uh, proportion of the total burden of diseases. For example, uh, in 2012, China had over uh, about uh, 264 million people with hypertension, okay? And uh, that, of course, is related, uh, the epidemiological transition is related to the underlying uh, demographic transition with the Chinese population getting rapidly old before getting rich, <laughs> all of them. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the uh, top uh, diseases, stroke, ischemic heart disease, COPD, uh, road injury, low back pain, lung cancer, liver cancer, and so on, uh, you know, are the, uh, uh, accounted for the top five uh, burden of diseases when you counted the mortality and disability uh, together. And this is uh, uh, article uh, published recently by my PMC colleagues and together with uh, uh, Chris Murray at the University of uh, Washington, Seattle. The underlying risk factors, I think, are well known uh, to people in this room. Uh, when I took on the deanship job <laughs> last September, uh, a lot of my close friends uh, send their condolences. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in part, uh, uh, it's because uh, the, the, the bad air uh, you breathe in, and that's not just, uh, you know, the, the you, you would think, you know, the LA fog you know, was something of a distant past, uh, but they all migrated uh, to, to China, and uh, not just uh, Beijing, all the major cities. Uh, have pictures like this, and uh, sometimes uh, days uh, in a row. But the Chinese people are resilient, right? <laughs> <laughs> they believe that you can <laughs> get out of those uh, risk factors by making your body stronger and shared by our panda. <clears throat> uh, also, another major risk factors uh, relate to. <laughs> Uh, the food we eat, and nowadays uh, the, the food in China. By the way, you, you all know that uh, uh, food and eating is a big part of the Chinese culture, and uh, we eat so much uh, more meat and also unsafe uh, processed uh, 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 food. And that uh, actually accounted, according to our recent estimates, the number one uh, risk factors underlying NCDs in China, uh, the food uh, safety an unhe unhealthy uh, diet. So obviously those major uh, challenges, uh, let alone the disparities which I will uh, escape uh, for uh, lack of time, put a lot of stress on China's uh, health system. So that next question naturally becomes, is China's health system ready? Uh, for dealing with this tremendous amount of major challenges. Now, to begin with, China's health sector, the health system, uh, has been on the path of being expanded continuously. You know, according to a study of my uh, group recently, almost we see the whole healthcare market size in terms of total expenditure double in size every five years, okay? For the past 15 years, doubled in size every five years. But three major problems. One is, it's not true when it comes to uh, expansion of health sector in China that uh, rising tide uh, help raise all the boats, you know? Nowadays, uh, when you go to China, you see at least uh, three worlds, okay? The coastal developed uh, cities, the vast uh, midland, mid-income countries, uh, uh, and, and the vast uh, western uh, rural areas, which are really on par with uh, uh, sub-Saharan 
uh, African country development stages. Okay, and this is a picture uh, out of uh, my winter session trip. You know, for the past uh, eight years, I offered a field study course taking the Harvard graduate students to China, spend three weeks uh, on lands, and uh, clearly we observed the, the vast disparities between uh, the rural healthcare system and uh, urban counterparts. And uh, in the cities, uh, for example, in Shanghai, the health uh, primary care system uh, even becomes uh, very modernized with uh, computerized <coughs> order entry and so on and so forth. But uh, in uh, <coughs> rural villages, you know, sometimes there is no rural doctor uh, to begin with. The second major challenge is the uh, cost escalation. And uh, uh, according to the two national household surveys, uh, the proportion of people's income spent on health not only uh, increased for the general population, but particularly uh, the medical financial burden uh, took a toll on low income households uh, in China. So healthcare affordability has become a second major problem. Now that cost escalation in part was exacerbated by the supply induced demand. Okay? Uh, two things you need to know to understand the Chinese uh, healthcare system. Number one, even though the healthcare system uh, in China is dominated by the public hospitals, okay? 90% of the uh, hospital beds are <coughs> owned and operated by the government uh, hospitals. But those hospitals, in my view, are only public in name, okay? They behave every bit like a profit <laughs> maximizer nowadays in China. Well, they are not totally to blame themselves. The system is wrong because the government budget only allocated for less than 10% of the total uh, expenditure the public hospitals in China would have spent. So 90% of their income have to be generated uh, from the user charges, okay? Number two, the payment system, including the social insurance payment system, are fee for service, okay? It's not based <coughs> on a, parkage, a, parkage, uh, a package payment like a DRG or something here where you would uh, have a risk, a financial risk sharing arrangement between the payer and the providers, okay? In China still today, the payment system is inflationary, uh, it's a fee for service. So that helped drive the healthcare cost. Another feature of China's healthcare system is the distorted pricing. All the prices of other goods and services are subject to the market forces supply and demand, but not healthcare. Healthcare uh, are still priced by the government pricing bureau, okay? So the government tells you how much you can charge for a bedectomy, for open heart surgery, for uh, a clinical encounter consultation uh, for an hour. That's all said by the government. And uh, meanwhile, all the medical services are basically underpriced by the government to allow the hospitals and the, the doctors in China to make a living, the government said, okay, I will let you charge a 15 to 20 percent markup for every drug you prescribe and dispense. Okay, so <laughs> no brainer, right? That will cost this picture and about 40 Five percent of the Chinese total health expenditure are drug, are drugs, expenditure on drugs. Okay, even in the states, it's le less than ten percent. Okay, so these are the major challenges underlying the Chinese healthcare system. Uh, the people are really uh, dissatisfied, and the government want to do something about it. Hence. The introduction of the 2009 healthcare reform <coughs> plan, exactly one year ahead of Obamacare. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
and uh, it's a long story because I was very closely involved in the Chinese healthcare uh, reform plan development. But uh, this uh, is an uh, attempt to summarize okay, what the Chinese uh, healthcare reform is about. I summarize the uh, triple A aims. Okay. Uh, I, I think this is not only uh, the aims or uh, objectives of healthcare reform in China, it's worldwide. All uh, various uh, healthcare reform programs really aimed at either helping improve availability or affordability <coughs> or appropriateness of healthcare. I, I don't, I'm hesitating using the word quality, you know, uh, appropriateness, because uh, high quality uh, for one person can be inappropriate, you know, for another. But anyways, uh, to achieve the three goals, the Chinese government developed the three major programs. The first is a vast increase of public investment in health. You know, earlier I mentioned the fact that the public hospitals are underfunded, right, for example. So Chinese government said, okay, I will increase uh, investment in health and I will also expand the basic social insurance coverage. Yeah. <coughs> and uh, the goal is to establish universal coverage by uh, 2020. The second major program is uh, essential medicine system uh, aimed at controlling costs, therefore Im improving affordability that way. And the third is to try to make public hospitals really behave like a public hospital. Okay, let me uh, uh, elaborate on each of the reform a bit more. Yes, uh, government uh, invests a lot of money, new money, into the healthcare, particularly the central government. Uh, a majority of that money went to support the rural healthcare infrastructure and the community health centers. Yeah. So I'm happy to know that you have a department on community health. I think that's uh, what's needed for a large country like China. You cannot just keep on building more and expanding the public hospital, tertiary hospitals. Uh, and also the investment uh, uh, used to subsidize the expansion of insurance coverage, uh, particularly for the rural population. So nowadays, <coughs> the rural uh, households only have to pay less than 20% of the total premium. The rest are subsidized by the uh, government, particularly the central government. So all four major insurance uh, schemes combined uh, would cover uh, about 95% of the Chinese population. Okay. Yes? That amount of increase, what percent was that actually, the previous amount, the top one? Oh, almost double. Almost double. Yeah, almost double of the budget, yeah, of the <coughs> government budget. So recently, my group did uh, a preliminary assessment of the performance or impact of the healthcare reform program uh, a pre-reform, post-reform, based on the available data. Uh, first, we look at uh, whether the expansion of insurance coverage really helped improve uh, affordability, okay? Uh, uh, availability first. Yes, uh, in terms of uh, average bed, uh, bed or number of health workers for southern uh, population, uh, that seemed to increase. And uh, this is uh, uh, the minutes uh, you, uh, uh, I, I mean, the, uh, the percentage of people who can have access to the nearest health facility within 10 minutes of walking distance. Uh, that seems to be also uh, I improved uh, in terms of availability. Now, in terms of uh, nominal uh, coverage of insurance, China, I think, can basically declare it already reached the goal of universal coverage because 95% of the Chinese population today are insured with some kind of basic insurance uh, uh, <coughs> coverage. However, when you look at the real <coughs> effective coverage uh, in terms of catastrophic spending, 40%, the, the threshold we use is 40% of your income, disposal income, 
spend on healthcare out of pocket, and that percentage uh, uh, seemed to decline a bit for the urban population and for the rural population as well, but still very high. As you can see, it's uh, uh, about 13% of the rural households today still suffer catastrophic spending in spite of the uh, rapid uh, insurance coverage. I think uh, uh, in part due to uh, the higher speed of medical cost escalation. So the major problems with the financing system today in China, limited benefit package, inadequate package for the poor, uh, a lack of portability of the insured, and particularly for the 200 million migrant workers, we call it, you know, uh, floating population, and they often uh, fall through the cracks. And the distorted uh, pricing structure and inflationary payment system, which I uh, talked about earlier. The second major reform program is establishing an essential medicine system. Realizing that overprescription of medicine is a huge problem, a huge driver for the medical costs, the government said, okay, enough is enough, okay? Uh, we are going to establish a national essential drug list. The government run <coughs> community health centers can only stock and supply the drugs on that list, okay? And second, how you make sure that the, the prices, the wholesale prices you got uh, is uh, low enough and the government established an uh, 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 ingenious public bidding system at the province level, <coughs> so organized procurement. And then, most importantly, before the reform, you know, every public <coughs> hospital or every Chinese doctor essentially was a drug peddler, right? <laughs> but now, zero profit, okay? at the community health center <coughs> level, you can still prescribe and dispense medicine, but you are not going to make any profits on that transaction, okay? So that's the uh, <coughs> essential medicine <coughs> system. What's the impact of that system? Interestingly, for the urban population, the average uh, cost per prescription came down a little bit, but the, for the rural one, it increased. For those of you who are interested in health system reform, I think uh, it pays to pay a keen attention to the details of the dynamics of how the system or the subsystem interact. Uh, according to my own field surveys, focus group discussions, <coughs> yes. Uh, the essential medicine policy was effective uh, for controlling costs at the community health center level. But the side effect or the cost of that policy is lack of incentive for the community <coughs> health workers to provide the services. So a lot of uh, referral upward, okay? You know, uh, before the reform, because the opportunity to uh, make a profit, they would <coughs> keep the patients and uh, provide services and prescribe medicines and so on. Now they say, okay, okay, you know, I'm too busy, go, and I cannot treat you properly, why not go to the county hospital? So that uh, uh, doubling of the referral services in, in some of our uh, statistic uh, analysis helped, you know, increase the overall cost of the system, even though you, know, you control the part of the system <laughs> at the bottom level. So that begs the question of the uh, you know, whole system design or redesigning. Okay, uh, but I, I want to point out this essential medicine policy uh, does have a significant <coughs> positive effect that is to control the serious problem of uh, overuse of antibiotics in China, okay? As you know, the uh, uh, drug resistance program uh, in China is getting worse and worse. 
And uh, nowadays, when you go to any clinic in China, you, you see patients light up with uh, IV injections, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, uh, this policy in our analysis helped uh, uh, reduce the use of antibiotics for both urban and rural populations. So that's a good, uh, good part. So in summary, China's health system today is uh, still facing three major challenges. One is the unbalanced utilization of healthcare resources. Yes, the government helped uh, strengthen the primary care, both in terms of hardware as well as uh, software, in terms of helping to train, on, uh, provided a lot of on-job training uh, for the uh, community health workers. But still, people don't trust uh, the quality uh, of the community health services uh, that much. And the overcrowding of the tertiary hospitals is still a very, very uh, common uh, phenomenon in China. And excess demand uh, not only exists for tertiary health services uh, in our uh, Healthy Beijing 2020 study uh, we are commissioned uh, uh, by the uh, Beijing municipal government to develop a 10-year uh, health plan uh, for the city. And we estimated these are the areas where uh, Beijing, uh, even Beijing, the capital city, has uh, a tremendous amount of excess demand in form of self-care, home care, long-term care, mental health, and rehab services. <coughs> the second major public policy issue or debate going on in China is the proper role of market versus government. Okay? Uh, the, the, this is an issue at the very top level. Okay? And because the rest of the economy right, embraced wholeheartedly market competition, <coughs> why not healthcare? Okay? So there are top advisors, particularly the economists, advising the president and premier in China, uh, you know, strongly advocate for a market-based approach. But then there are people, me included, pointing out the market failures in healthcare. Uh, there are abnormalities of health sector information asymmetry for one. And, uh, uh, and then uh, advocate a balanced role of the two uh, leverage or two means. But that debate is still going on. Probably the most difficult challenge is this. I call it the trust crisis. You know, Chinese consumers simply do not trust their doctors. Of course, they don't trust anything nowadays. They don't trust their government. They don't trust their <laughs> teachers. Uh, but you know, probably you would expect the health sector to be the last sector. Last man standing, right? Last good man standing. But even in the health sector, there is a widely perceived decay of professionalism and uh, ethics, medical ethics. This is a survey uh, done by a colleague of uh, Kong and all in 2020 when they did a large scale access survey among the patients, you know, about their satisfaction. And uh, one question is, what do you think the, pay, uh, the doctor in your last encounter, according to your, ex your experiences and <coughs> perception, whose interests the doctor put first? Only less than 40% of the patients say, yes, the doctor put the patient interest first. About more than 60% said, no, I don't believe the doctor put my interest first. They put their financial interest first. <coughs> They're in the business to make money, not to serve me. And uh, <coughs> many patients and their families you know, are so angry and uh, they would kill doctors and nurses and this uh, violence was still on the rise. You know what the government did in reaction? They require you know, all the hospitals with more than 500 beds to literally establish a police department <laughs> within the hospital, okay? 
you know, for the past eight years, I have uh, helped uh, graduate uh, more than 600 uh, senior Chinese uh, health executives through the China Initiative uh, Leadership Development Program. And one <laughs> last year at one of the uh, hospital CEO <laughs> conference, one of my students came up to me. Uh, he's uh, uh, a president CEO of a large hospital, Hunan province. He said, Dr. Liu, I remember uh, we had a debate about uh, how to uh, solve the patient-doctor uh, relationship. Because uh, at Harvard training workshop, I invited a team, you know, uh, a, a department chair, uh, a surgical department chair, uh, 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 chief nurse, and uh, uh, a social worker department uh, director, a three, a trail, conduct a, a dialogue, uh, sharing the American experiences, you know, how to deal with the uh, patient-doctor relationship. I said, I, I tried them, you know, but they don't work. <laughs> the Chinese patients uh, and their families are very hard to, to be persuaded. So you have to take a hard line. And finally, I found a, a, a very good solution. I said, well, what's your solution? I said, I turned my uh, 150 uh, staff uh, security force. Uh, I turned them into part of the local police uh, forces. They all got trained by the local police department. They are the fifth branch of the local police department, but only salaried by me, okay, by the hospital. So they wear the police uniforms, so that said, <laughs> said <laughs> no more violence <laughs> because of the uniform, <laughs> the deterrence. So this is a really sad uh, situation and still uh, waging. And uh, this is probably only seen in China. The doctors and nurses are so scared and sometimes they have to wear helmet to go to work. <laughs> so to take care of their own lives before they take care of the lives of their patients. This is uh, really happening uh, in one of the hospitals in Shenzhen. So no wonder uh, a year ago <laughs> I, I surveyed, <laughs> I, I surveyed uh, about 100 uh, hospital CEOs in my training program. I ask them whether you want to your children to study medicine in the future. Seventy percent of them said no, 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 no. So it's a, <coughs> it's really a sad situation right now. So it is against that challenging background. My university and my new school uh, is charged with the mission of trying to help make a difference. Now Peking Union Medical College, some of you may know, is still the leading medical school or medical university in China, which was funded by Rockefeller Foundation uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, here I stole a slide uh, used by my wife, <laughs> Dr. Jing Ma here, uh, a few days ago. And uh, this is uh, the, the commission report now, the country is so vast and the resources available for dealing with the problem are so limited <coughs> as yet that the need of outside assistance is still very great. 1914, okay. A few years later, <coughs> uh, China Medical Board was established by the Rockefeller Foundation to help fund uh, P Peking Union Medical College, PUMC for short. Now, at the very beginning, the university, the forebears of the university put emphasis on preventive medicine, public health, and community health services. Uh, John B. Grant, the father of the late James Grant, you know, who served as president of UNICEF for many years, was the first chair of my public health and hygiene department at PMC. Okay. And he pioneered the public health institute in early, uh, uh, as early as 1925 in collaboration with the police department uh, in uh, municipal government of Beijing at the time. And subsequently, he also 
uh, pioneered China's first uh, three-tier rural community health network, baffle doctors model, for instance. Okay, and so it's really on the shoulder of those grants, uh, those giants, <coughs> we uh, stand today. Now, for historical reasons, my university was merged with another organization in uh, 1954, the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. So PUMC and Chinese Medical uh, Academy of Medical Sciences is the same organization, two, <coughs> two hats. They, wear, they are wearing two hats. And among that organization, there used to be a Chinese Academy of Preventive Medicine. And the, that was the precursor of the School of Public Health of PMC. But that institute was moved out of my university in the 1990s by the Chinese Minister of Health to form the China Center for Disease Control and Prevention, China CDC. Okay. So since 1990s, my university did not have a, a functioning School of Public Health. So I was charged to basically build a new school of public health with the legacy, with the heritage. But how can we do, uh, do something uh, different while uh, building on, expanding uh, the legacy we have? I'm keenly aware, my colleagues and I are keenly aware that we're facing some new challenges uh, today in China. Uh, that wasn't uh, faced by our uh, forebears. That, of course, include the straight, uh, three major transitions, which have tremendous amount of implications for our new research and educational programs. Uh, for example, a lot of uh, NCDs have to effectively deal with by effective intersector collaboration, right? That is really way out of the traditional purview of uh, a CDC system, okay? And uh, communication skills, uh, uh, health and linking health and development, right? Intervention studies uh, with a strong practice focus and so on, you know, are something we need to uh, consider when we build a new school. And also realizing that so much of the current Chinese education system uh, still stuck with the primitive uh, informative training <coughs> rather than formative and transformative training. So we intended to develop innovative programs in all three spaces of education, research, and uh, practice, hopefully to make the new school uh, one of China's or the world's uh, uh, excellent schools, <laughs> excellent <laughs> schools, okay. And uh, of course, we are, well, earlier uh, in the hallway, I talked to your giant here, Dr. Fielding, about his advice for me uh, to build a new school. And he advised, actually, I share his idea, is maybe to make the school a more flat organization, to bring down the walls of the traditional departments, I actually advocated that model, yeah. But then my leadership uh, at the university helped me uh, come down to the reality. He <laughs> <It> said, <laughs> you know, when you want to recruit good people, right, they need to have a title. <laughs> if you don't have a department, then you don't have a chair. And so many people want to come here to be chairman of something. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about uh, idea meets uh, reality. But anyway, so uh, five departments, traditional biostat, epi, uh, uh, occupational, environmental health, and uh, here all in uh, close collaboration with China's uh, CDC, uh, SFDA, and so on and so forth. But I want to uh, emphasize two new departments. One is the behavioral sciences and health communication. You know. So much is about uh, changing behaviors uh, and health policy and the management. 
to translate uh, evidence into policy and, uh, and, and practice. So in that effort, I really want to appeal to you uh, to help us and, uh, and uh, along the way establish uh, a win-win collaborative uh, initiatives by uh, doing uh, exchange of student faculty, collaborative research, and collaborative uh, development. Really, is we can think about you know, opportunities for going out together, for raise funding support okay, for our uh, initiatives. So a lot of challenges, exciting journey. Yeah, I welcome you to be part of this uh, journey uh, together. After all, we are living in an uh, increasingly globalized world, and China is just an uh, ocean away <laughs> from that. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. this uh, conflict into perspective. You know, with the rapid uh, <coughs> rising of income and uh, living standards you know, uh, is the rising expectation of a consumer. Mm -hmm. you know? And China is uh, every bit like a consumer society nowadays. You know? And uh, you know, when they go to the restaurant, you know, people serve, they, they serve them so nicely, hotels, you know, and so on. So, uh, of course, by comparison, they demand more out of health care. Mm -hmm. But uh, meanwhile, their lack of uh, good doctors, the lack of uh, a good quality hospitals, and the people are on long queues all the time. So that's, uh, that's one uh, reality, is the mismatch of demand and the supply. The second, uh, I think uh, people are also uh, disappointed about the fact that nowadays the Chinese doctors uh, spend so little time with them, you know, because the, the, uh, a typical doctor in Beijing uh, sees about 60 patients a day, okay? So, you know, they just uh, try to get to the next patient. And uh, so they don't feel uh, listened to and cared for and respected. Uh, and uh, that, of course, uh, uh, would uh, easily uh, result in medical errors. You know, uh, Lucian Leap and others uh, put out the report uh, estimating that in this country, the annual deaths uh, from uh, <coughs> medical errors are as high as about 100,000, right? Uh, nobody dared to do a similar study in China, but I think the numbers should be much higher than that. So. There, I think uh, uh, people's uh, dissatisfaction or violence uh, against uh, uh, providers, in some cases, uh, are not uh, totally unfounded, okay, uh, unreasonable. The third, I, I would say, is uh, really the whole, the, the medical profession as a whole lost its logos, right? lost its meaning, uh, lost its uh, aspiration uh, to the high moral standard, okay? And, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes I even engage in debate with my students, the clinical <coughs> leaders. You know, they will say, hey, Dr. Liu, don't be too hard on us. <laughs> Look at the government officials. How many of them are not corrupted? You know? <laughs> well, I said, <laughs> the moment you don a white coat, right? You owe the society and the people, right? To put their interests first, yeah? That's a huge difference, being a doctor and uh, some, something else, right? A uh, corrupted government official may have serious consequences, but your immoral conduct may result in life and death, right? 
So I think China has a long way to go in terms of uh, professional professionalism strengthening. What is the uh, uh, ratio of doctors per population in China? How does it compare to the U.S.? And then what's the ratio of specialists to or generalists? And how does that compare? And I wonder if that's changing with the changing expectations. Uh, it's just, I think it's just, uh, uh, lower, uh, probably by about two doctors per thousand uh, uh, compared to China. Is this a two versus a four or something? I, I, uh, I couldn't uh, quite uh, get the uh, top of my head. Uh, uh, but uh, it's safe to say that uh, there is also something called over-specialization in China. Okay, uh, uh, that has to do with the Chinese medical education system. Uh, after four or five years of medical school, you are assigned to a hospital. Then you work there for life, basically. <laughs> and, and, and you are not only assigned to a hospital, you are also assigned to a particular department within that hospital. And uh, then you are stuck with that department for life. So China is in the process of uh, changing that system uh, uh, learning from the U.S., China is in the process of uh, uh, first uh, uh, doing pilot uh, on uh, the three-year uh, standardized uh, uh, medical residence training, okay, and uh, uh, then uh, uh, in the hope to producing more uh, generalists than uh, specialists, uh, including the uh, the primary care. Particularly. That's right. Yeah. yeah. There are three uh, major things on the uh, public hospital reform agenda. Uh, number one is to control expansion of public hospital, to make room for uh, the private uh, sector. Okay. Uh, uh, second is to uh, uh, change the financial incentive for the public hospital to over uh, prescribe, over pro provide services. <laughs> and by uh, global budgeting, by paying the hospital on the more package, the payment uh, 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 mechanism, uh, DRG included, uh, still uh, on the uh, pilot stage. And uh, also uh, by holding the President CEOs of public hospitals accountable for inefficiency uh, and the waste. Okay. So these are the major uh, programs on the public hospital reform agenda. Yes. Is there a historical precedent uh, of uh, downgrading physicians uh, going back to the 1960s, uh, uh, the uh, uh, barefoot doctor model, uh, which sort of uh, influences a, a historical mem a memory of people that doctors are, you know, could be very much downtrodden or downgraded. If anything, the opposite uh, seems to be happening. The government seems to, I mean, majority of the government officials uh, seem to believe that even the rural villages deserve better, deserve be uh, more than the uh, traditional doctor doctors can provide. As a matter of fact, uh, in many places, the government through the regular medical examinations, licensing processes, uh, made many practicing rural baffled doctors illegal uh, if they failed to, uh, to, uh, to pass the state uh, administered uh, examinations, which I don't believe is a good policy. You know, I think China is so vast, right? And uh, assistant physicians, uh, minimum trained health workers, uh, health volunteers even, you know, do have a role to play in certain places. <laughs> But in the effort to uh, raise the standards of medical care in China, 
uh, the government may, you know, cause some harm to the underserved areas. I think you do have a point. But that being said, I, I, I have to mention that uh, there was a recent policy. <coughs> uh, this is a Chinese invention. They call it the budding system. You know, uh, remember China is still a one-party rule and uh, government-dominated uh, 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 healthcare system. So the government can give directives. Okay, so one of the directives that the government gave to the tertiary hospitals is say, okay. If you want to keep your job as the president <coughs> CEO of this hospital, you have to find uh, a buddy in uh, uh, less developed uh, rural uh, uh, counties, you know, as your buddy. And uh, if you send me the list of your buddies, and then I, I'm going to monitor uh, how frequently you send the medical teams down there to provide uh, consultation and on-site training and receive uh, training, uh, trainees uh, from that uh, budding system. So I call it the medical budding system. So in that way, uh, the government trying to make their tertiary hospitals uh, you know, uh, help uh, elevate uh, the level of uh, uh, care at uh, less developed regions. But uh, I heard the mixed uh, uh, stories about uh, the actual effect of that policy, but that's one of the remedies the government trying to address, uh, use to address the <coughs> imbalance problem. Uh, thank you very much for such a challenging, uh, outlined all the challenges. I think that you know, the problem with you know, uh, China is that uh, there is not enough adequate distribution of the resources. I think the doctors are underpaid. And that's the reason why for you know, them, they have to rely on red envelopes, they rely on you know, bonus, to allow them to have a decent living. Now, the other problem is that, uh, as I see it, I've been following China for 40 years in the, the healthcare system, particularly in the area of integrated health. I think the SEI paper requirement has affected the clinical capability of many of the doctors. The, 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 I mean, many doctors basically, if they are top notch, they go to work in the Sanja Yuan, okay, the top hospitals, and they are, they are forced to basically Follow along, you know what is really the right thing to do. Okay, publish the papers, get the grants, and then you know uh, do all the studies that you know, for the professors. So a lot of the, the, the people who are not as you know uh, uh, top notch, then they work for the lower level hospital and, and the community, you know, and then and then they do not have the ability to really feed their family. So I, I you know and I, I really think that, that that accounts for a lot of you know uh, the, the medical professions morale and, and also the, the, problem, the loss of trust between the doctors <laughs> and, and also the, uh, the, uh, uh, the patients. Now, one thing that I, I, I agree, I agree. I think the compensation uh, needs to be higher for the doctors uh, through the formal channel, formal right? channel. Yes. not formal under channel. the table <laughs> payment. Take the, money, take the money out of the, the patient and the, and, and the doctors. And I think that that should be a better way for for that, you know, uh, redistribution <coughs> of resources. And I think that I think that's very good. But the other thing that they've been working on, and I've been advocating it, and I think that uh, is the, the the role of integrated medicine in China, which has been developed for integrated meaning the Western and the and Chinese Chinese in China. So, so we, we, I mean, for for CNT, what I write right proposal, say that China needs to push it and push it really hard, train the Western doctors appropriate Chinese medicine, and also. You know, the people who are in Chinese medicine be involved in outpatient care. And that's why in Shanghai, one of the major projects for Shanghai City Health Bureau is to have 12,000 physicians and public health workers and rural village doctors who are training residents who learn Chinese medicine. So, so that's right. basically, I, I, I believe that, that that may be a good experiment to see what you know, in, in Beijing, I know that. So I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's such a rich topic, and, and we're running out of time. So I think I'm going to see if we can get one more comment in and give the last word to Dr. Zhu. I agree. Let's uh, stay in touch. <laughs> <laughs>
I think money is no longer an issue. Uh, you know, the private sector has a lot of money. And uh, the key is how can you hire good doctors, especially hire good doctors away from the public hospitals. Yeah. And uh, all the good doctors nowadays working in public hospitals, they are spoiled by the bad system, okay? Because of the informal, under the table, and red envelope payment are extra, uh, astronomically higher than the meager salary they receive from the government. And meanwhile, they receive, uh, they enjoy the high respect uh, uh, academically and so on and so forth. So the cost for the private sector to hire the good doctors, you know, away from the public sector, uh, is uh, very very challenging. And uh, you know what? The government now is on the <coughs> side of the private sector. So the government said, okay, uh, in addition to uh, controlling expansion uh, of the public hospitals, I allow the public hospitals to have multiple practice sites, okay? So to encourage uh, and sometimes uh, uh, force the public hospitals to allow their doctors to have a, a joint appointment with a private sector uh, hospital, okay? So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's happening. But I don't know whether that will help <laughs> the, 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 uh, the healthcare improvement in China or that also uh, uh, will attract a lot, lot of uh, uh, profit motive, uh, uh, motivated the investors. So this is a conversation we hope to continue here and in Beijing. Please join me in thanking Dr. Liu for coming.